1 Kings 18, beginning in verse 17, the Bible says, And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Are he that are art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal four hundred and fifty, and the prophets of the grove four hundred, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah said unto all the people, and Elijah came unto the, all the people and said, How long will you, you be between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. And, but if it, if it bail, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. Then said Elijah to the people, I, even I only, uh, even I only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullet for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put it on and put fire and put no fire under and i will dress the other bullock and lay it and lay it on wood and put no fire under and call ye on the name of your gods and i will call on the name of the lord and the god that answereth by fire let him be god and all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first, for ye are many, and call upon the name of your gods, and put no fire under. Dear Lord, we thank you for your blessed holy word. We thank you for a place to meet. <coughs> Lord, we praise you for those that are gathered today. We know uh, that they're not here by chance, but rather by divine appointment. Speak to the lost, speak to the redeemed, and we would be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, some fairly familiar verses of Scripture. The only living prophet at the time comes uh, up against and a lot of times the other group is uh, left out, but 450 prophets of Baal, but we'll see a little later, I think, in the Bible that only 400 of them show up. And then there was uh, 400 prophets of the God, uh, the God of the Druids, the, uh, the ones that worship the groves is what the Bible calls them. They worship trees, they worship nature. Uh, that's very much a modern day thing. It, it is about to take over. But I want you to see, collectively, that was 850 persons against one man of God. And you know, a lot of people uh, very quickly get discouraged by numbers. Listen, the Lord's people has always been in the minority. And if I understand the word of God like I think I do, they always will be. We'll always be a people that's small in number and we'll always be a people that don't fit in. That's why he called us pilgrims and strangers because we're, we're not normal people and that's okay. In fact, it's a favorable thing with God. So we have this era or, or this time in the, in the history of the nation of Israel where everyone was becoming Baalist. The, and and Baalus, if you really follow the history of that thing backwards and then forwards to today, uh, they're very much like a Masonic lodge, uh, and that is kind of where where the uh, modern day group is. But now I'll say this, and we'll move on. That group is going down too. Uh, praise God for that. And, and uh, I want you to see that. Uh, there's always been that opposition there. And uh, so we find in the Bible that Elijah has a plan from God. And anytime we're given a plan from God, we need to execute it as the Lord's church. 
Now, it may seem strange to the flesh. It may seem hopeless. It may seem even to our little bitty carnal minds as foolish. But it should be followed. God's plan is always sufficient. And so we see that situation rising up. First of all, in verse 17, uh, we find that Ahab approaches Elijah. Now, uh, Elijah was a very brave man and probably did much better than I myself would do. But uh, just a few days later, uh, Elijah himself finds uh, he, himself in a mess. But let me say this. Uh, one day of victory in Christ is worth the rest of your lifetime. Yeah. And, and are you going to fall some days? You betcha. You're going to have some defeated days? Yes, you will. But you know what? The majority, uh, the days that you are on the mountaintop are worth all those valley days and the sum total put together. And, and so we see that Ahab actually approaches Elijah and say, why are you troubling Israel? Now, what was this trouble that he was offering? He was at offering hope in the Lord God Almighty. And they didn't want it. You know what happens today? You preach the gospel and it's not wanted. Right. And not, not, the, the, really, it's not changed a whole lot, has it? It's been kind of that way since the, the onset of mankind. And even now today, you preach the gospel of hope and it's not wanted. It's, it's not received. It's not appreciated. Verse 18, and he answered, meaning Elijah to Ahab, and he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house. Now, I want you to see now gets down to the point of being direct. Now, I think one of the modern day problems with the church, and it, it, it is a balancing game, and I've seen extremes on both sides. Uh, I've seen some Baptist preachers of our stripe that like to pick fights. They'll go in a, a group and deliberately say something to anger everybody in the room. And then I've had the other side where they would almost uh, they would almost agree with a Campbellite. Uh, I think God defending God's people defending the truth is somewhere in the middle. And, and so, what why what was he defending? Well, Ahab says you're troubling, and he says, No, I'm not the one troubling. I'm the only one left that's standing. You're the one troubling Israel. And sometimes that's very difficult to say. You know, one of the many people that's troubling the United States today, Joe Biden. Right? It'd be very difficult to say that to him in his face, would it not? But we as, uh, we as the Lord's people ought to be that way. So Elijah is placed in this circumstance, this situation, where he has to defend the house of God. He tells him specifically at the end of verse 18, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all of Israel unto, uh, unto the... Uh, now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. Now I want you to notice that uh, these ungodly men are celebrated by the government. Uh, it says that these uh, 450 prophets of Baal and these uh, 400 druids or tree worshipers that they set at Jezebel's table. You know what? That tells me we shouldn't be alarmed in the modern day when they're received better than us. Uh, the, fa the false prophets are enjoyed by mankind. And you know why? Lost people like lost people, right? right. And, and, and so we see that it should be no amazement to us, and it certainly did not amaze Elijah. He knew they were there. Verse 21, And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you halt between two opinions? Now that's a very good question, and being as good sovereign gracers here at New Testament, 
We don't like to think much about decisions, do we? And we're going to avoid that word if we can. But you know, this is the reality. There are decisions to make in the service of the Lord. Sure. Now, I don't think you can decide to be saved, but I do believe I can decide how I'm going to how I'm going to serve him. Right? I could be the one going after a hundredfold, or I can put half my heart into it and go after forty. Right? That 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 is up to me. So he stood before this great multitude, all the population of Jerusalem, and say, how long are you not going to make a decision? How long are you just going to stay like you are? You know, uh, what? the way I understand it is almost uh, uh, Balaam was saying, you need, to either, you need to either come with me or you need to go wholeheartedly with Ahab. You need to do one or the other. Verse 22. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. Now, if you underline in your Bible, you understand, you underline that middle statement, I, even I, am alone. Was that true? No. You know, we got to be very careful about getting prideful, don't we? Remember when he went up on the mountain, old Jezebel said, I want to have you by tomorrow. And he believed the lie. And he ran up on the mountain. He met God there. God said, listen, I've got 750 that haven't bowed their knee to Baal. <laughs> right? So you got to be careful when we're in situations like this. And you know, God gave him a great victory that day. But don't let the victory give you fleshly pride. Because the victory comes from the Almighty. The victory comes from the Lord. So certainly there's nothing for us to be prideful about. It's, it's, it's all of the Lord. And he and so we see one maybe little foretelling sentence that problems could be on the way. <clears throat> but Baal's prophets, rest of verse 22, are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks. And let one choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put on fire and, un and put, put no fire under it. And I will dress the other and lay it on wood and will put no fi fire under it. And call on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the... Uh, and, and let and the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. Now, I think that's a very interesting statement because when it says all the people, was it talking about Israel? That would have been all of one group that was there, right? Was it saying all oh, like everybody under the sound of my voice this morning? Because if that's true, and I believe that's what he meant, the prophets of Baal was going a good deal. <laughs> in other words, they sincerely believed in their false prophets. You know, that's a dangerous thing, is it not? Yeah. You know why people, and, and, and calling the, uh, the, uh, the awakened movement or woke movement, thinking that all sin is okay and it ought to be celebrated, you know what? They really believe that junk. You know, at one time I, I, I thought, well, they're just being rebellious to God. No, no, no. They actually believe that. That's very sad, is it not? And you know why I think it's sad? Because if the Lord had never opened my spiritual ears, he that had an ear let him hear, I'd be in the same, I'd be in the same shape as they are. That's right. That's when salvation... Uh, become something you're thankful for because but for the grace of God there go I and so we find that they actually did believe it was a good plan verse 26 and they took the bullet which was given them and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning unto noon saying oh Baal hear us but there was no voice nor any that answered and they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon, 
Elijah mocked them and said, cry loud, for he is a God. Either he is talking or he is pursuing or he is on a journey or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. <laughs> and they cried loud. In other words, they cried even louder. And they cut themselves uh, after the manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. Now, as an aside, just as verse 28, and you can think of this this way, wait during your prayer time. And I don't know about now because I'm a little more disconnected than I was a few years ago. Praise God for that. But I had a niece that cut herself. A uh, very, very big thing in the early 2000s. And in high school, her, her friends, that was one of the things they did. But listen, that's not a new origin. That's been around at least since here, right? Uh, you, you know, uh, serving a false god will make you even abuse yourself. And so they made every effort they knew how to do. Verse 30. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Now, if you follow that history, Elijah had broken it serving Baal. And Elijah took 12 stones around, uh, according to the number of the, tri uh, of the tribes of the son of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And the stones he built, and, and with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him in, and laid him on the wood and said fill four barrels of water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood and he said do it the second time and he said it and they did it the second time and he said do it the third time and they did it the third time now i want you to see in addition now god's going to manifest himself in great glory now, uh, all, uh, at least two families in here, myself and the Anders Andersons, we burn wood. Now, how would you like to build a fire with wet wood? You know, Brother Downs used to say, how are you going to get it set on fire if your wood's still wet? <laughs> right? And so, Elijah was going to prove once and for all that the God of the Bible did not work on terms of man. Now we know in the flesh it is impossible to build a fire with wet wood. But listen, if you got God on your side, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. And, and that's, that was the reason. Plus, you think about this was in the height of the drought of Elijah and how precious water was. You know, if you want to serve God, it's going to cost you something. And, you know, I think the most interesting thing about this, this section of Scripture, no one opposed it. Now, if I was thirsty and there was a drought, I'd been like, listen, that, that water would, would give everybody in this place a drink of water. Don't do it. But Elijah said, dump it on in there. Dump it again, dump it again. To literally, there was water standing in that little uh, ring he dug around there. That's the God of the Bible. And uh, so everybody now had to be saying, this is an impossibility. There's no way that this is going to work. Verse uh, 36 and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said Lord God of Abraham Isaac and of Israel let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word hear me O Lord hear me that, the, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned, and thou hast turned their, 
and that thou hast turned their, their back again. And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. That's the God of the Bible. Y'all ever seen a rock burn up? I ain't. <laughs> but you know what? I know God could do it. I've seen rocks get a little soft because they're exposed to heat and then maybe you could hit them with a hammer and bust them up. But I have never seen a rock burn up. And you know what? Even with wood, and everybody's favorite part of, of burning wood is the ashes, right? Me and Donna, sometimes we almost want to flip a coin who's going to have to do it today. And uh, uh, I've never seen it completely burn, have y'all? I've never had a fire that didn't create ashes. But God can. God's able. And it literally said it licked up the water. So that was a great victory. You know, the rest of the story... Uh, he, he called on Israel to defeat the Baalists. They ran after him, and all 400 were killed on that occasion because they had seen a move of God. Now, that was a great and wonderful victory, and certainly that's the victories that we like to see. But I, I want you to see another kind of victory that's a little bit harder to live in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians 11. Paul writing the second time to the church at Corinth. And if you remember, this is the second letter, a little less scathing. <coughs> he was thrilled that they had improved the way that they had. He was thrilled that the Lord had drawn closer and brought back to the truth. And in kind of the middle of that, in verse 23, uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23, the Bible says this, Are they the ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. Now, what he was talking about was people who were trusting works again, who were trusting being Jewish again. Am I the more? And labor's more abundant. And stripes above measure, and prisons more frequent, and deaths oft. Now, here we begin to see that victory for the pilgrim is a little bit different. Victory for you and I, and it's not to set aside and say that God could not lick up water with fire today if it be so his will. He certainly could, but the victory for the modern New Testament believer, our victory is quite different. And so Paul begins to relate his victory to hardship. He begins to relate his victory to what he had bore for Christ. And I say, well, all these new Baalists, if you want to call them that, these false churches are growing is because there is no suffering within. There's nothing but victory. There's nothing but glory. There's nothing but health and wealth. And what the victory for the modern day Christian is not pleasant. It, it, it is not something that we enjoy. So Paul begins to remind the church of Corinth, this is what happened to me. Verse 24. Of the Jews... Five, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Now that's the 39 strike beating that the Lord Jesus uh, experienced it on the day of his crucifixion. He had endured it five separate times. That's the one I told you about that most did not walk away from. That many times after the stripes, depending on how many pieces of bone and metal was into the whip, that literally their liver fell out of their backside. He says, I've stood it five times. You know what that is? That's victory. He was still standing there. He said, I was stoned. Y'all remember the story of the stoning of Stephen? His, his, his brothers in Christ were out there around him. They thought he was dead. 
No doubt they were talking about the funeral. They were talking about how they were going to remove the body, and he stood up. <laughs> and they went on for the gospel of Christ. You know what that is? That's a victory. That's a glorious thing. That, that's an unusual, an unusual event that he counted as wonderful and, and, and not as an issue, not as a problem. Verse 26. In journeyings often. Now, the older I get and the older you get, the more you like staying at home. Right? By this time, Paul was probably in his 50s, maybe even further down the road. And he says, in journeyings often. There were four mission trips of Paul. In a lot of Bibles, they're outlined on somewhere between the covers when you see all the little maps and stuff that they give us. Are you ready to do that? In journeyings often. You know, often, I, I certainly believe this, if it's a man of God, especially a preaching man of God, you're going to have to get up and do something at times. In journeyings often. You're, you're, you're not going to have your full fulfillment of your ministry by sitting, simply sitting in Dover. And, and, and so we see, he reminds them of that. I went out. I did what I was supposed to do. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I was in the deep. In journeys, often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen. Now, I've never been robbed. And uh, this is one of mom's touches of wisdom when I was a kid. Larry, don't show everybody your money, you'll get knocked in the head. And I was like, well, uh, I guess there's some truth to that. <laughs> Apparently, you know, even though Paul probably didn't show his money, he got robbed anyway. You know what? As we get closer to the coming of Christ, travel is more dangerous. Sure. You know, when we went to Mexico the first time, me and Donna and the kids, literally all we had to do was show them our birth certificate. And you can almost print them off the internet these days. The only thing, and it, it, uh, it, it wasn't... It wasn't a big thing, but it was uh, the only clinch that we had the whole time we went was two issues, and this was both in Nashville, Tennessee, which shocked me. Uh, at that time, the girls wore their head coverings all the time, and they took Sarah's head covering and went off and, and let her hair completely down. And uh, I guess they thought we had a, a bomb in Sarah's hair or something. And... Then the other thing, Donna had, as usual, brought something to keep her busy, and she had a little bitty thing of scissors about like that to cut a uh, thread with, and they took Donna's scissors away from her. And, but today, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe what they do. You go like this under the little scanner, and they scan you down, and Lord only knows what that's shooting you with, and then... They give you up close and personal pat down, and uh, I know that excites you, Justin. Uh, just give you a heads up there, and um, then they let you on the pine. Uh, and you know what? It'll get worse. Mm -hmm. The new question will be, why are you going? Yeah. What are you going to do when you're there? Right. That th those are the pieces that are coming very quickly. And if you, if you say, I'm going to spread the gospel, they'll probably tell you, no, you're not. You're staying in Nashville. And that is the day which we live. So we see what, what appears as defeat, according to the scriptures, is actually uh, in the victory. It is actually what we want. Perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. And I want to see all those per uh, perils were experienced outside his home. Now, where was Paul's home church? 
Antioch, right? That's what he was sent out of, best I understand the scripture. None of these perils occurred at home. You see what I'm saying? You know what? I, I would to God, and I don't think you would. If I ever get stoned, I don't think it's going to be here at New Testament. Because all of y'all have an understanding and appreciation and, the, and a love for the Word of God. But that, that's the exception, not the norm. And, and so we see the victory looks quite different to the New Testament believer than it did to the Old Testament believer. The victory here is, is not what most mankind thinks of victory. In weariness, in other words, wore out, I remember years ago, I probably don't remember this, when we managed those apartments, once a year we had to go down to East Tennessee for their meeting, a uh, very strange meeting, and there were some uh, friends of ours that were Campbellites, and he was a Campbellite preacher, very nice couple. I always enjoyed seeing them and saying hello. Uh, 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 one thing, we had, I can't even remember that boy's name, but he, he said, I said, where do y'all go to church? Oh, we go to a Christian church. And I said, oh, you're Church of Christ. <laughs> and uh, uh, he, <laughs> he necessarily didn't like that. But uh, we, were, uh, we, were, we were talking, and there was this guy. He would go from all those apartments from one to the other. He's a maintenance man. And, and our boss would make him go from one, uh, one place to the other constantly. And he could sing a little bit, and he, he wrote this song called Wore Out. I'm Wore Out. And it, it had a lot of, and he talked about the air conditioning and the plumbing, and then he'd say, I'm Wore Out. <laughs> and this boy's, <laughs> this boy's wife looked at the comments and said, this is a cry for help. <laughs> and uh, that, that's what weariness is. And I don't think very many of us have been that weary for Christ, have we? Have we, have we expended enough energy to say, listen, I, I'm completely wore out with preaching, with teaching, with whatever service you've been given to the Lord, I'm weary with it. In weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. He experienced things that probably we never will. But you know what? He didn't count it as defeat. He counted it as victory. So next time you think you got the honey drummies, maybe you're actually gaining victory. Maybe actually you're getting closer unto the Lord. Remember when Stephen was being stoned in Acts chapter 7? He, uh, <laughs> they're ready to stone him. He's already, already getting the stones flying. And he says, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Yeah. You know, how, how much more victorious can you be? That's right. Literally seeing the person of Christ on this side of eternity. Now, I'll, I'll say this. As soon as he seen Christ that way in his glory, he was good as dead. Because the Bible says no man can see God and live. Right? Remember Moses wanted that. Yeah. The Lord God said, well, you can't have that. <laughs> but Stephen had it because his life was very near the end. What kind of victory have you had? You know, sometimes, and you have to be cautious of your flesh. A year from now, I will have pastored this church 25 years. You won't find that in modern day churches. Uh, you know, especially the Armenians, man, they're done with in about three years. Right? Move you on and, and get somebody else. <coughs> but there's no boasting in that. Right? You could also look at it like this. I pastored a church with 12 members for 30, I mean for 25 years. You see what I'm saying? There, there's always two, two ways to look at something, right? 
But see, God's been good, has he not? Yeah. I'm going to look at it like a victory. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to look at it like, huh, like uh, it's one of the best things that ever happened to me. So how do you look at victory? It, it really, you know, you know why there's so much depression today? Because nobody looks at what they should as victory. Right. Amen. They look at it as defeat. Mm -hmm. 